Uh, Mike Altieri with the LA Kings. Uh, thanks everybody for joining us this morning. Um, as everyone's aware, uh, the LA Kings, uh, LA Kings center Andre Kopitar has assumed the role as the team's new captain today, effective today. And um, at this time, I believe we have Dean Lombardi on the call, who is available to take your questions regarding this news. And at this time, we will uh, open things up. Yeah, hi. It's Helene Elliott from the LA Times. Uh, will Dustin keep be an assistant captain? And can you talk a little bit about uh, what went into this decision, please? Thank you. Um, as far as assistant captains, I think uh, you know we're still working through that a little bit. So um, that's probably something for down the road on how who the assistants exactly will be. But we should have an answer on that. Um, Fairly shortly, so um, as far as the, the, I don't know what part you want to start with, the process or the um, substance. So um, I said, which part do you want to focus on here, Lee? Well, why why did you make this decision? Why did you feel this was the right decision uh, to be done now? Okay. Um, well, there's a number of things that go into this. Um, number one, I think um, being a captain, there's no doubt um, that you're not only responsible for your own game, but 23 other players. And that is uh, an enormous responsibility um, that... Um, you know, has an enormous amount of work uh, to be responsible for 20 people. Um, the second part of this is this is something that we, you know how I feel about culture and chemistry and uh, the things that don't necessarily show up on a chart or anything uh, of that nature. Um there's, my feeling on this is that at some point there has to be an evolution in the growth of some of your other players, the players that have come through the system. It's essentially their turn. That's what, you know, I look at this, is players such as Kopitar, Dowdy, Quick, Muzzin, all these players we brought along to in an environment that would help them become winners in a sense of, you know, their own play, but also become winners in the sense of being leaders. And that is something that I think takes a lot of time uh, to nourish, uh, a lot of having the right people around them. Um, and if you look back, at the evolutionist team when Dustin took over, when we were a very bad team. Um, you essentially had only, you know, three young players at that time with Boloff and Camilleri and Dustin. And, you know, we selected Dustin, obviously, to be the captain of his team. But part of that process, don't forget, was to bring in guys that had won that were leaders in their own right, whether it was a, a Justin Williams, a, a Mike Richards, a, a Jared Stoll. Uh, the skidaries of the world. But all during that process, you were looking at those extremely young players, the 19-year-olds coming through, that they were needed to take this all in because someday it was going to be their job. But I don't think this is something that you just hand to a young player when he's 22, 21, when he's still formulating his own game, still formulating uh, the idea of what it takes to lead, but take it in every bit and it's been going on essentially for seven, eight years. But now it's their turn. It's their turn to assume this responsibility. And, again, this is something that was on the board, that a transition needs to take place, and they've been groomed for this as players and as leaders, and now it's their time. And it was just like, like I said, Dustin did a tremendous job. You know, if these guys now, having learned from him and those other players, you know, can do half the job that he did, 
you know, they'll get one cup. But, again, I think they're ready for it. I don't think they were ready for it, you know, maybe two, three years ago. But now's their time. And part of that is a transition in Dustin's job. You know, maybe he didn't have, you know, he was able to lean on Williams and those guys as he learned the process. Um, I think he can be an enormous help to these players as they work through all the issues that comes with being a captain. And I think the thing that often gets lost in this role is how much work it really is, that it's not about taking ceremonial face-offs. You're responsible for everything on and off the ice. And like I said, these guys have been groomed for it, and it's their time. And so, um, you know, I think in reality, the thing that makes this difficult, I guess, in hockey per se, is it happens in other sports all the time. It just doesn't, it, 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 it evolves on its own without the signature of a letter being on somebody. You know, whether it's Derek Jeter assuming the mantle from Don Madden. Every team, there's, there is a transition. It's generally been a top young player that's come through your system, and it evolves. It just doesn't come out in this dramatic sense where a letter is transferred from one player to another. So, like, in reality, this is what happens with most teams anyway. And these guys also need to be responsible for establishing – um, you've heard me say this before. I think that one of the problems um, that we've had with our success is that thing I said four years ago that a pretty smart guy said to me, that whenever you've won, it's not recapturing the feeling, it's reinventing the feeling. And that, require, and that requires these guys now to establish their own identity, their own basis to lead, and their own basis to get to the same place that Dustin took us. And... So, like I said, a lot of thought has gone into this, but it isn't something that you you know how I believe about teams um, and how they evolve that isn't the physical part of the game. That these, if you call it about your inner circle, circle of identity, it's a it's an it's an involvement that these you keep your young players off to the side and let them take it in, but every year they should be starting to move towards the middle of then taking over. And, again, this is something that Kopitar and the assistants are, are, have been bred for, and it's their turn to assume this responsibility. And, um, it's like I say, they're inheriting this from Dustin, and they should be able to learn a lot from him. Uh, and take on this the role of being responsible for 23 guys. Um, as far as, um, you know, like, it, it, again, I, I think it's like I said, I think there's that that no team in, in any sport doesn't have this evolution. It's just that, you know, it's like there's this feeling in hockey that it's a lifetime appointment, per se, because of the letters. Um, and that's just something that's not always practical uh, in a real sense. And, you know, this puts that puts the, the, the responsibility squarely on the guys who need to assume that role right now. So that's kind of the, the thought process here um, in going through it. Um, I think, you know, in terms of the way this process works, um, there's a couple of things um, in my experience with players and particularly dealing with uh, difficult situations, um, and this was certainly uh, unique, that when you first approach the player with this, it, it has to be a process. There's a lot of things go through his mind. So this uh, is perfectly prepared to walk through this um, and take the time necessary because you don't you don't solve this, per se, with a player of Dustin's stature, um, a player who has, you know, has to be right now the best captain in King's history, having two cups on his side, which nobody can match, without, you know, being prepared to walk him through it as he goes through the his own mind, what this means. 
so we met on this. Um, geez, um, I'm trying to think exactly about maybe four weeks ago or whatever. Uh, I first broached it with him. Um, and like I told him, I said, okay, um, you need to walk out of here, take it all in, and come back and see me when you get your thoughts. So we had another meeting. Went over a number of things from his perspective. Um, then we had another meeting. And then he, uh, it was imperative that he meet with Daryl. Uh, Daryl flew back and met with him, and they talked about it and what his role needs to be and what he needs to do going forward. Then he came back and saw me two more times. And, you know, to get him in a place, uh, to number one, um, I think, like I told him, that he can be a big asset, just like Williams and those guys helped him. He has to help these guys, having been through what he's been through, and, and make them as good a leader as he was. Um, the other part here that's critical, like I told him, and I think part of this is that when you have the responsibility for 23 guys, he has uh, – he, perfectly recognizes that for us to be successful as a team, he needs to get his game back to where where he's capable. And um, there's no doubt, particularly I think this year, uh, that he uh, showed up in uh, one of probably the best condition he's ever been in. Um, I think despite, you know, that he hasn't produced at the level he's certainly capable of, I don't think it's been his effort. In a lot of cases, it's because he tries so hard and is so critical of himself and he puts enormous pressure on himself that this isn't a player where you have to, um, you know, he's not up to his own standards because he's not working or he's become disincentivized because of a contract or anything like that. It's almost because I think he's put too much on himself. And then we had a number of meetings, uh, even with the assistant coaches, about putting the time in now to, to figure out how to get his game back to where, you know, the one time, he, not long ago, he was one of the best power forwards in the league. And that's where our focus has to be, solely on his game, and then let these other guys, who it's their turn, uh, assume the responsibility. doesn't mean that you're not going to be called upon at times to advise these guys and help them through. But the second part needs to get done um, and, you know, we put it all in and away we go. So I think that's about as good a synopsis as I can give you of the thought process and, and, uh, and then the process itself. Um, so I, I don't think I left anything out. But go ahead if I did. Thank you. Dean, this is uh, Josh Cooper with Yahoo Sports. Just you talked about Justin's role moving forward. Um, how kind of do you see him and his contract and and whatnot? I mean, it's a big deal. His his production has gone down quite a bit. Is there a hope that? that he can rediscover with less pressure? I know you touched on that a little bit. And and also, I, I, have you thought of, of other options with him, or are you guys all in, on board with him moving forward? Uh, what, what was the first question there, Josh? Um, uh, what was the first one? <laughs> well, with less pressure, just being able to rediscover that production. You you, met, you touched on that a little bit, but, I mean, have you seen that with players? I mean, I know, you know, for example, some of the situations in San Jose and whatnot, just having some of the less leadership burdens on them to rediscover that? I, I think it, I think it, um, it doesn't drive the bus. Um, because, like I said, um, the, the, the first part is what drives the bus, that it's time for Kopitar to take over. He's been bred for it. He's been trained for it. He's one of our top players. And essentially, it's, he's moving into his prime, or he's in, and it's his turn. That's the way we look at it. Somebody else's turn to assume this responsibility. A second part of that might be just that, 
that because, that, that now, because when you move the discussion from dust and right, you, you got to get from there and now say, okay, what's important for you? And the most important thing is to get your game back. And then secondly, to assist these guys just like you were assisted as you were going through the process. But the driving the bus was something that's always been in the back of my mind, that the young players who came through and have become top players now need to be top leaders. And But I do think because of, like I said, make no mistake, if this job is done right, it's a lot of responsibility. It's no different than when I'm scouting in Philadelphia. I've got this role. I'm not responsible for, you know, 20, you know, five scouts and, you know, all this and everything else that goes into the infrastructure. It's the same thing. But they, so his focus, though, critically has to be on his game, and I think there there is some merit to that. The most important thing in our discussion in and as having met with uh, our minor, our, our uh, assistant coaches, was that he's really re- ready to buy in, so to speak, to micromanaging his game. Because there's no question he works. There's no question he shows up physically prepared. We got that part down. And if that wasn't there, then we're, we're completely wasting our time. But um, so that that could be a bro- byproduct of it. Um, but it didn't drive the bus. Thank you. Dean, it's Helene again. Are you at all considering a buyout of Dustin Brown? No. No. No? No. Okay. No, cer- certainly not at this stage, no. No, I, I, I think he's I, I really believe he's going to get his game back. And, um, you know, there's no there's – no, he's not – Physically, um, like I said, he's in the best shape he has ever been in this past year. And you look at him now, and he's, um, to me, he's still in his prime. It, it's, it's, um, you know, getting that focus on what he needs to, to get back to being one of the top five power forwards. But there's no physical hindrance to him not getting back into that caliber player. Like I said, I think we last that question, Helene, I think that would be maybe at this stage more of an issue if you didn't believe the kid cared or the kid, you know, you know didn't really want to get back there and was content. I, I don't see that in him at all. Hey, Dean, this is Dennis Bernstein. Doesn't he have to get top six minutes from Daryl? to get to where his game is back. And he was up and down the lineup from first line to fourth line all season. Have you talked to Daryl about the usage of this player? No, I don't, I don't, I don't think if, if you internally in how we view a player, um, um, for, for each player, there's a standard he needs to meet to fit within the 25. It's essentially a job description. Yeah. And all these jobs are utilized for ice time, power play time, and things like that. So without going into our template per se, where, so to answer your question, it's not, it'd be nice, um, but when we say get your game back, we're looking at certain things that are normalized for minutes played that mean you're meeting it and you don't need 30, 30 goals. So when I say get his game back, it's not necessarily by definition get 25 to 30. Where he needs to be has a different standard that he's perfectly capable of meeting um, regardless of power play time and, and ice. Now, obviously, there's some element to it, but it's not driving the bus. Uh, because I think you're probably looking at it and say, get his game back, well, that's a 30 goal score, requires him to be on a power play and play a lot more like he did back in that era, maybe when we didn't have other players. That's not the case. And that was also explained to him about where the job description needs to be for us to win. 
And if every player meets his job description, you got a chance to win. And it, and it showed up then, conversely, the struggles we had during this year, where and it's where we're not where we need to be at certain um, positions or roles, so to speak. But I was taken out of the equation when I met with him and, and showed him, and he didn't disagree. Um, so, and then, you know, the other thing, too, is I, I'm, I'm also fairly it make logical that if, in fact, those standards are met, which he clearly understands he's capable of and should excel at, that now you probably get more ice time and then maybe the job description increases and you move to another role. So where we need him right now to be um, is not related to any ice time in the past. Hey, Dean, it's, it's Lisa. Um, a question slightly off track. Um, are, are you more optimistic about uh, Milan re- returning uh, than, than you were the last time we spoke or, or less or something in between? I think it's pretty safe to say we're, we've, um, we've had, a, had to do a lot of work here um, given um, um, some of our due diligence um, it's probably safe to say we will be making, um, I guess we want to say our best offer under the circumstances, um, probably the early next week um, is probably the way I envision this. Um, I said there's a lot of due diligence that goes into um, formulating an offer. There's no question we want him back, and um, I think he clearly wants to be here. Um, but... Uh, there's a number of things we had to work through that we didn't anticipate, and but we haven't given up. But so um, we've had a number of conference calls on how to structure this under the circumstances, and I think we're going to have something here I, I envisioned by early next week, and that will give them some time to think about it. But after that, I don't think there's much more work we can do given what we're up against. So. All right. Thank you. Dean, this is uh, Josh with Yahoo again. Sort of following up on that a little bit, Pittsburgh won the Stanley Cup with what was described as a dramatic speed game. Does that change the way you want to go through this offseason with how you construct your roster and the types of players you're looking to supplement into it? Um, I don't, I don't think, um, in looking at where our holes were this year, um, you know, and there were things that, um, you know, having lost some players in critical roles that we saw issues back in September, um, we did not feel uh, the need to change our identity. Our problem lies in, I guess, not having certain roles fulfilled, um, I guess, and that's one of the good things about having won in the past, having that experience to draw on and realize the nature of the whole. Our problem, I don't think, um, again, this wasn't nothing that surprised us per se um, in the playoffs. And um, even at the stretch, um, that there were we were vulnerable, and we knew it. And so and it had nothing to do with speed or our identity. I think it's a big difference between looking at your team and realizing you you got some holes and, you know, the exercise we would always do in September and October and things and try and match up like we knew how uh, the team we had when we won. We knew what it looked like when we played a team like Chicago, which it was almost identical 
um, which lent itself to going seven games in double overtime. It, it was almost, if you looked at it and scripted it and looked at how those, those players matched up, it was exactly what was going to happen. Somebody was going to win on a fluke goal in double overtime. So you have those things there, and you're looking at this. we got some holes here, certainly compared to what we had. Now, how are we going to address it? We tried to address it a number of ways throughout the season in terms of developing from within, uh, trying to plug the holes with the deal we made with Philadelphia. But make no mistake, we knew we were vulnerable. And then, um, you know, we really got exposed in the playoffs. So we had two issues here, I think. There was a structural issue. That's my, you know, clearly, um, you know, your, the, the personnel side and being able to fulfill certain roles. And then, like I said, I think there's the issue of, you've heard about me allude this to at the end of the season, I also think we had some mental issues in terms of having dealt with success and uh, a good punch in the nose like we got in the playoffs hopefully woke us all up in terms of, uh, you know, some of the things that we need to do. So I don't look at it and say, well, we're too slow. Um, we, we're looking at it from we, we have some holes. Now, if those holes are filled and it ain't good enough, then I think your question has more relevance. Or, no, I'm not, not saying it's relevant. Your question is relevant. It's just it's not driving the bus for me. Uh, I would drive, if, I, if I felt that these roles were being fulfilled, uh, which, again, we had on the board in September and October, then I think I'd probably look at it more. But I think it's always a danger, um, you know, that <laughs> we're the number one defensive team in the league. Uh, you know, uh, the, uh, there's a lot of impressive numbers there in terms of, uh, you know, whether these goals are for, goals against. Now, surely there's areas that we need to improve or weren't where you want them to be, but there's a lot of good stuff there. And I think what happens all the time, too, you know, it's just like with us. Uh, you know, we win two cups and everybody gets big and strong and everything else. But I think everybody underestimated our talent. Like, we were, we had an identity. Uh, but it's like somebody asked me, well, um, you know, to similar to your question, the person asked me out of month, I said, well, okay, usually that's an indication that you're lacking skill. Well, probably the most skilled setting in the game now is three-on-three. Three. And you look at the guys we can throw out there. And we were 9-1 and one when it was three-on-three. Three and uh, three on three. That's your most skilled situation in hockey for speed and skill and everything else. And you can throw out there a Carter or a Tafoli, a, a Kopitar, a Dowdy, a Muzzin, two kids on the U.S. Canadian or Canadian team. And we're 9-1. and one. So if you're winning that battle so to speak, you're probably a pretty skilled and fast. It's just that I think, um, and we will not sacrifice our identity and what we believe in. It's like I said, in terms of uh, the change here made from the captaincy is we're going to get there a different way, but I don't see us changing our values and our identity. There's certain things expected of every player. Uh, we know it wins, but I think it's too easy to look because we're big and tough or whatever you want to call it. You overlook the other side. So when I throw out there the three-on-three, well, look at those guys. You tell me we ain't got skill, we ain't fast. So, I no, I don't see myself doing that, and I'm not going to get caught up in flavor of the month. So. Thank you, Gina. It's Lisa again. In terms of um, uh, organizational depth at goal, goalie. Um, do you anticipate Enroth going elsewhere and then finding somebody else via free agency or moving Peter in there? <laughs> I don't know. It, it, it's so um, – I don't I think we're going to run the – run the uh, – so Billy Rutt run for it to run as an independent contractor and just get us development fees for goalies, you know. It's so <laughs> hard to, to – I, I, I'm, I'm still – trying to figure out how to run that, you know, food chain, so to speak, that, you know, we had a wealth of riches and, riches and guys coming through your system, but all four of them, you can't keep them. You know, so you got four goaltenders and, uh, out there, Baruby, Jones, Adcock, and Bernier, that, 
it would have been great for us to have. They came through our system, but you can't keep them. And then you look at it and say, well, what's the use? And then, but obviously, too, it's something that's critical because it's such a critical position. Um, I can't think of any other analogy than backup quarterbacks. And you, and you see how hard it is for a team to get a bona fide backup when you have a top quarterback. You know, and even Denver Broncos, they lose their guy that they were breeding, and he goes somewhere else, even though the job's there. Um, so I, I, I'm, I got to admit, I, I got to reexamine this, um, and I'm not sure how to do it. I guess, uh, you know, it's certainly not a strength of our reservists now where it, we had those kids coming through. Um, but then, like I said, if they're coming through, well, what good is it if you can't keep them? I, I don't know. I, I got to, you know, as far as us doing it this year, um, you know, we clearly don't have a young guy ready to even move into that apprenticeship as he learns to trade. So probably safe to say we're, we're going to have to go outside the system again. But in terms of devising the plan on how to do this and not just end up developing them for other teams, I'm, uh, I'm not sure yet. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> this is Stephen Lieberman with the Culver City Observer. I'm just curious, uh, were there any other – was there any other player or players on the team that were considered to take over the role as captain? If so, who and, and what went into that um, decision-making? Um, yeah, I think um, there were um, you know, a number of players um, considered. But like I said, I, I, we looked at this in the long run. And someday I'll show you. know, we had um, – like I said, you sure refer, refer, refer to a circle of identity that um, these guys, it's not something that just comes up. Again, the, the, it, it's like you're trying to, I don't want to use the word breeding, it sounds inhuman, but it, again, this is something that we were watching all along. It is, where is Kopitar? Where is Dowdy? Where is Quick? How's Muzzincone? Martinez? All these kids have grown. And but certainly the the ideal situation is when that you know that it's you know that top player who plays the equivalent of maybe a quarterback position, which is usually your defenseman and uh, your number one defenseman and your number one center. Um, so it's probably safe to say that the, the guys who will be uh, trending towards on the assistant captain would have certainly been considered for this. Um, but they were bred for what they're going to be doing, too. Um, it's just you can only have one captain, per se. So, um, like I said, I, I think um, as far as the assistance right now, we're, we still got some work to do in terms of preparing them for what their responsibility is. But today we're just focusing on the captain. And, and um, so we had... When you know we knew this going, we had a number of meetings with Kopitar and talks with him. That you know what you're getting into. Um, you want you want to do this job. Well, here's the way we see it. So um, to answer your question, I think it's probably safe to say when we name the A's, you'll probably see the guys that were also in the mix. And they're all worthy of this. Uh, you know, it's their turn. Like I said. Well, we have everybody on the line. I'd like to let everybody know we will have uh, an availability on this this same conference line at 1 p.m. with uh, Andre Kopitar. Um, are there any further questions for Dean? Yeah, one question for Dean. This is John Hoven. Question is about the younger players and the need to get those guys mixed into the lineup, not only from a salary cap perspective, Dean, but also from a, from just a positional standpoint in, in, in your your infamous boxes. What can you tell us about guys like Michael Mersch, uh, Dowd, Gravel, those sorts of players coming into next season? I think probably the best way to put it right now is uh, those kids you've mentioned, it's safe to say that they've paid their dues and there's a job for them to win. You know, so 
you know how I feel in trying to bring young players along a certain way. Um, they're in the final stages. It's like, okay, they're, this summer they'll complete their triple-A ball, and um, now there's a job for you to win. And so, and I think they're ready for it, but it's going to be up to them now. Um, so, so, you know, we're we're counting on them, but they still got to get it done. So the guys you mentioned, that's probably the way I'd put it right now. There's a job to win. Thank you. Okay. All right, guys. Okay. Thanks. All right. Thanks, everyone.